As I think back to American history, I'm struck by what got us to the place where we are. Uh, there have been some great moves of God, but how in the world did did the church get to where it is where it, where it doesn't really look like the ministry of Jesus? Safety and comfort, those are our false gods. The American dream collides head on into the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where we're at in America today, it's hard to be a Christian. Uh, we're desperate for a move of the Holy Spirit in our nation once again. What does our nation need more than any other thing? It needs revival. It needs a revival that comes in the people of God, in the people of God, taking that which is becoming routine, familiar, dull, absorbable, moribund, and transforming it. Revive me. Revive me. Revive my heart. Increase my interest in the things of God. Make me diligent for your truth. Can you imagine what may happen, what God may choose to do? Uh, just woke up this morning, was still in my underwear when we got a call and said, hey, the governor was supposed to fly out this morning, but he didn't. Um, would you like to take uh, Pastor Joshua and go and meet with him and uh, spend some time praying? Like, uh, yeah, we can definitely do that. It was uh, just an amazing time, actually. The governor even took us over and showed Joshua the place where the very first martyr of the United States, the very first Christian martyr of the U.S. Um, it was a painting that actually depicted that time. The secretary that, that controls the, the flow of the people coming in and out of the governor's office, she said, I'm praying for the Chinese every day. So here's Joshua. He's this pastor from the underground house church in China, and he has spent much of his life running from the communist government in China. But here in America, he's welcomed with open arms as a hero. What makes America so different? Is it the laws? Is it the people? Or is it something that goes all the way back to the times of revival when America was a colony in the British Empire? What followed in many areas of the British Empire were these men and women who were sold out for the Lord, men and women who just gave up their lives to go over to, to and often never return. They went to Australia, in, in, in India, uh, Hong Kong, parts of China, uh, and, and many other places, but not just east, but it also went west. What went west? Revival. But the early Americans had another name for it. The Great Awakening. When I look at the first and second Great Awakening, where these great men of God were preaching with fire the Word of God, and, and people were coming out in, in droves in great numbers, repent or perish and that was a strong message and it caused people to think about their lifestyle and what was going on. I often read uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, not every year, but I try to read it about once a year. The message that was not a friendly one, mm -hmm. the um, a, a one that um, I would see people running away from. These men began to proclaim a truth that many of these people, it was revolutionary to them that God is calling me to a righteous lifestyle, to a lifestyle that will invade every one of your boxes and require you to live a certain way no matter what. This truth that these men were bringing was a game changer. After the first great awakening in the 1740s, it happened again. And this time they gave it an original name, the Second Great Awakening. 10,000 people showed up on the frontier. 10,000 people in 1801. Yeah, showed up in covered wagons. And I mean, suddenly it was like almost overnight, this 
little village for them. Because I mean, this this is an era before microphones and speakers and auditoriums and... Right, some people believe that the Second Great Awakening lasted from 1801 to 1805, but other historians believe that it actually lasted from 1801 into the 1830s. So it was quite a quite an amazing move of the Holy Spirit. I got you, you got you. As I look at the history of revival in America, there is this one group that's always overlooked. They're the neglected misfits of American revival. And they may not seem to fit in with the cool crowd, but they are essential to the American tapestry of revival history. I love being out here. I grew up in Northeast Indiana, in Amish country. I mean, it's so interesting. You can walk into a church of like a hundred people and it's only got like three or four families. <laughs> Half the church is, is uh, children. They actually use an acronym, Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. That's how they live every part of their life. Amish furniture, Ed's buggy rides. You have these different things that, you know, kind of symbolize being in an Amish area. I think traditionalism, I think, you know, maybe legalism. When they see the Amish, when they see the, the Mennonite community, the last thing they think is revolutionary, mm -hmm. radical, uh, rebel. Uh, when Americans think of Lancaster County, oftentimes they think of, you know, the Amish community and then the school shooting that took place several years ago. My oldest sister, she, they had three daughters in the schoolhouse when the shooter came in and ended up into a uh, blood bath shootout and five of the girls got killed and five of them got wounded. Mm. Uh, I had two nieces that were in there at the same time. One slipped out the side door, the other two were in there at the shootout, the one got killed, the other was wounded. What was the response of the Amish community towards the shooter and the shooter's family? Yes, they battled with grief and battled with different things that people battle with. Uh, within a few days, they were um, contacting with the shooter's family and telling them that they forgive them. Jesus taught us to pray the, the prayer of forgive us as we forgive our debtors. And so that's prayed a lot. You know, things want to rise up, anger wants to rise up. Uh, why did, were they allowed to do that? And you have to just forgive again and forgive again. And even it goes way back to uh, the the uh, persecution of the Amish where it was forgive, forgive the persecutors. And so it's kind of ingrained into the whole culture, the whole our DNA almost is you, you need to forgive. Anabaptist means to baptize again, right? The initial teachers believed that um, you could only make that decision to follow Christ as an adult. Right. So this revival of individual faith, yes. you went from Europe and then that came westward to America. Yes. Here in America today, Christians all around take that for granted. Going to church, being part of the church is voluntary. But that was a novel thought in its day, and men paid for it with their lives. It began a group of people that would say, the word of God is my authority. I'm going to put my neck on the chopping block for the, for the Lord Jesus. I'm going to follow him even unto death. And the blood of those martyrs became the seed of the church. And so they were killed. All but one of them were killed, and he died before they got to it. And there became this groundswell, grassroots people movement that swelled up. And these people seemed to defy death in its very face. For instance, they would baptize in the town square, knowing that if they get caught, they could die. Baptize publicly and run. They wouldn't just do it in a corner. But that first generation was just passionate about Jesus. And every time the blood spilled, more churches sprang up because people said, that fella, that woman, that lady has something that I want and I will die for. You even had young people wishing they could die. They're not lukewarm, they're not complacent. When you get filled with Jesus, the same essence comes down. In the 1950s when that revival happened, there was an absolute thrust forward of missions. Um, there is Mennonite communities all around the world in various areas. Right now, what could you say is the state of evangelism, outreach, and missions? Well, first of all, the mindset of we don't evangelize has 
has to break off. There are people uh, in the Amish community getting born again and they're getting uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. We're seeing different evangelistic types of outreaches that are starting to happen. Do you encourage them to take on the Amish lifestyle? Pointing people to Jesus Christ, and yeah. it's not the the Amish lifestyle. Because I'm not sure I yeah. could grow that much of a beard. You have to grow that beard. <laughs> an extremist Christian would actually be the exact opposite right. of an extremist Muslim. To follow him in the extremist of manner would almost be the same as like a Namish or Mennonite. But it's time for another revival. Mm -hmm. I love hanging out with these guys. It's so refreshing to see how family oriented they are, how Jesus oriented they are. And they challenge me to see God from a different angle. I think about all the folks that I've seen so far, the Jewish believers, the African Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, the Protestants, the early American Puritans. They're all different. And then I start to think about the more recent history. What did revival look like in the last century? So in 1898, he moved his ministry here into Topeka and specifically into this building. He called this the Bethel Healing Home. They would bring people in and the 13 healing rooms upstairs is where they would house people, preach to them, speak to them what the Word of God says. So that's what they did. And he was a man of prayer and prayed 24-7 in that tower. Beginning of the healing rooms, it's probably safe to assume that it's not that much different than it was during those days. Not really. And so once they were well, and he'd move them on their way and bring other people in. But when he left, he put two people in charge here of, of his congregation, and he was away for three months. Mm -hmm. When he came back, they would locked the doors, changed mm -hmm. the locks, and they kind of took over. And when he came back, Agnes Osman is the person who received the, the, the baptism first. Uh, asked him to lay hands on her and pray like it said in the book, book of Acts. He laid hands and asked for her to receive, she received. Mm -hmm. And she spoke in Chinese, six different dialects. And so that, that's what they call the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So there was a building out at the west side, and it was built by a man named Stone, and, and it looked like a castle. And it was in 1901, New Year's Eve, January 1st, uh, that the Holy Spirit came down, touched the very first person. There's nothing to actually show that this was the birthplace of one of the largest movements that the United States had ever seen. Finally then we head in, into the early 1900s and we, we see Azusa Street and here's this black man, William Seymour, who uh, had this uncommon hunger for the move of God. And he prayed like five hours a day for two and a half years. And at that point, the Lord, he was talking with the Lord, and the Lord said, you know, you just need to pray more. When Pastor Seymour first came to Los Angeles, he came as a pastor that was hired uh, by a church uh, in this area. He came from Houston to here. I think he probably thought that he was going to be used mightily by God in the church that invited him to come. After his first meeting, he actually got kicked out. I uh, got locked out of his church because he was teaching about the Holy Spirit. And uh, he had some people that brought him in, let him have a place to stay, and they had this intense desire to have the Holy Spirit come and join them. So for 10 days, they began to fast and pray that the Holy Spirit would come. Mm. The charismatic movement that we're seeing today in China, the largest revival um, in the world today is actually taking place in China. It can be said that it started right here at this house. This is not a place that you usually see in history books unless you specifically study uh, the charismatic history in the United States. This is where it kind of started. So many people gathered on this porch just to get a peek inside the windows that the porch collapsed. And that, that was their first sign that they needed to move out, of, move out of here and find a bigger location. And that's what led them to Azusa Street. 
Pero esa señora no está, creo. Es una morena. Ah. Many people say that Topeka, Kansas is where the, the, the Pentecostal uh, revivals took place. Um, but that was really for America. That stayed pretty rural. Here was the starting of it becoming international. And today, with over 600 million believers, the largest Pentecostal revival started right here. 我们也奉献了名，在此为美国这块土地祷告。昔日你使用这个地方兴起那么多爱你的门徒在这，祷告敬拜你的灵教官，唤醒他们，让圣灵的火第二波再次燃烧这个国家。阿门。阿门。We actually never planned to come here and do this filming until we had to have a meeting in uh, San Diego. We thought, you know what the heck, let's let's go to Azusa Street. You said that your GPS said it was right here? Yeah, it's all in this area here. So what used to be the Azusa Street Revival is now a part of the Japanese American Cultural and Community Center. But this right here would have been uh, the Azusa Street. And now today it's, uh, it's an alleyway with a thousand to a thousand five hundred people crowding into this small place. This was the place where the Holy Spirit came down. There were people coming from Africa and Asia and Europe and South America because they had heard about the revivals that were taking place here and this strange new phenomenon of speaking in tongues. A big change from just a hundred years ago where a small black church came together seeking after God and ended up changing the world. Uh, this was never supposed to be an altar that, that Christians come to uh, to find God. Today, the, the revivals that are taking place in China um, shows that God is continually going to the place where His people are hungry. And if people would have just stayed here and basked in the presence forever, they would have never been able to go to the nations. <laughs> William J. Seymour, the impact that the Azusa revival had on North America and countries around the world. This was another revival that, that took America by storm. There has never been a move of God that has not been ergated. Wow, undergirded. <laughs> that was a new word, that was a new word, okay. If we go all the way back to um, the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit fell upon them, it didn't just affect Jerusalem, it impacted the world. It revives, it brings back to life the passion, the zeal. You need that though to bring the harvest in. Revival sends the laborers and we bring in a massive harvest. In the process of making this video, a giant in the faith went to be with the Lord, Billy Graham. Billy Graham spoke to more people face to face than anyone else in history. Like all the heroes of revival, he will be gone, but not forgotten. Gordihan 十架虽重我主恩更多
二月二十二号是我六十岁生日的时候，二十一号的早上，我突然逮到一个信息，说一代熟龄的伟人比利·格里汉离开了世界。那个时候我听到的时候非常震撼，比利·格里汉他就是当今时代的伊利亚。他带领着一个实际的人，能够使老百姓的心归向父神，对人灵魂、爱人灵魂的孤入感，爱人灵魂的迫切感，爱人灵魂的使命感，爱人灵魂的缺切感，都是得救的缺切感。他一生影响到可能几亿的。呃，人类因着他听到耶稣基督的福音，我感觉到这个是非常重要的一件事情。哈利路亚，<笑>就是不是要他那个那个名利或权利，乃是要他那个爱人灵魂的心，燃烧自己像一粒麦子一样，真正的埋在西方这块土地上，能够带领不同国家、不同民族。黑人、白人或华人、黄皮肤人一起一个方向，把福音传回耶路撒冷。哈利路亚，有请！哈利路亚，<笑>来拉下手。<笑>这条路上我们共患难。Even though I was born here, I haven't lived in America for almost twenty years. So in many ways, I'm practically a foreigner. I thought it might be helpful to bring together a group of people from all walks of life, from all around the country, to discuss revival and Christianity in America today. When Jesus says, "And you shall be my witnesses," is this a, the grand suggestion, or is this a commandment? I mean, it's black and white. There's、yeah. no gray area about that.、Yeah. We are commanded to do it, and we will be rewarded for it. E- even when it's preached, we think, "Well, if we're in a congregation, obviously it'll mean us because." We just justify, but in reality, are we going to really go? Are we going to really give? I, I know in our church we do have a large missions focus,、um, and we're in I don't know, twenty, thirty countries, and they encourage short-term missions trips among the congregation. Is short-term missions as effective as long-term missions?、Um, short-term missions, I think, are almost more for the Americans than they are for where they go. There's a good aspect to that in that Americans need to be woken up. Where are the main destinations? Are they going to areas that have already been evangelized, or are the churches focused on taking、uh, teams to go into areas that have never heard the gospel? In our church, it's pretty much the same places.、Yeah. So you're not wanting to send kids, obviously, to Afghanistan, it, right?、Yeah. Exactly. But I'd say more often than not, it is an area that is somewhat already evangelized. But I, I'll be honest with you, I don't see that much change in the last. Ten years. I don't. I've been to a lot of churches in my in the different places that I've lived. A common theme is、uh, the missions budget. How big is the missions budget? It's usually below ten percent. And what if instead of you know having big church buildings, we could give a hundred percent to the mission? You're hitting now right to the core of America. You know we want to be comfortable. There's so many needs. Where do you start? He doesn't call us to solve every need. Because we can't do right. it. Right. My, my passion is, I believe we could live differently and give more. I'm, I'm afraid. The truth is, in the American church, the Western church, a lot of people are stuffing cotton in their ears. Put books on. You know, how do you listen to the voice of God? Well, He's talking. Just be quiet for a moment,、mm. and and He's He's talking. And don't be afraid of what He's going to say. I think there's a lot of fear in the church, and I, I know because I happen to have won a gold medal.、Um, Olympic gold medal in fear. I don't mean to brag, but I'm pretty good at it. And God just showed me nowhere in God's word does anyone get a free pass out because of fear. Do you want to read an epistle, James?、Mm-hmm. A couple of things. First, he says true religion is taking care of the orphans and the widows. Yeah. I read on the news every day, and my heart is torn.、Mm-hmm. I have three beautiful children, a comfortable home, and a wonderful, safe environment in the United States of America. Do you know there's kids that have lost their parents? Girls, I mean, girls younger than my daughter, who have been raped, and they they need Jesus, and they need clothing, and they need hope. You know, if I get the honor and privilege to go and help them, forget rewards or even judgment. If Christ's love is really in me, would I not want to do that anyways? Would I not want to sell everything I have and go and 
And even if it's in vain, I don't know what I'm doing, so what? Because I believe the Spirit of the Lord lives within me and I can go there and I'm going to be the light of the world that the Lord said I'm supposed to be. We don't need any more lights in a football stadium that's got a gazillion megawatts of illumination. We need to go to those dark places of the world and be the light and the salt of the earth. And when that salt becomes no good, the Lord says, it's thrown out. If I'm sitting in my armchair watching, you know, whatever TV show, I mean, these reality TV shows have consumed our society. Man, we're missing out. Go live it for reals. Because Jesus is real. And we have the gift, the opportunity to go and be his hands and feet to a dying world and go to those dark places. Why are they dark? Because there's no light. And if our hearts aren't broken with the Lord, yes, Houston, we have a problem. We have a problem in the Church of America today. And we need to fix it. And um, I'm willing to go, and, I, and I'm going. How do you spend your free time? Facebook, emails, news, um, which I'm an addict of. I love the news. We At make all. our own news. <laughs> 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 I love it. <laughs>